would like to start by welcoming everybody to uh, another round of Life Behind Life from Behind the Walls. So we're very happy that you could find the time to join us here today. We are live from beautiful Aarhus, um, where society is slowly reopening. So we hope that wherever you're watching from, things are looking up as well. Before I hand you over to my colleague, Hugo, and all of the great speakers we have lined up for you, I just have a few things to mention. So first of all, uh, this talk is being recorded and it will be posted online afterwards. And I would also like to present the organizing team. So <clears throat> Peter Gorm Larsen, who is the initiator behind this concept and a professor here at uh, the Department of Electri Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, sadly, he couldn't be here today, but he sends his greetings. And then we have uh, Hugo, who will uh, take over Peter's uh, normal role as host, moderator and timekeeper. And my name is Lida, and I'm the community manager of Orbit Lab here at the department. And if you feel like it, uh, you're welcome to present yourselves and to each other in the chat. Uh, very quickly to those of you who are not familiar with Orbit Lab, I can tell you that we're a tech hub uh, and a tech and innovation hub and an open community for anyone with an interest in digital technologies. And as I said, we're part of the department as well. So if you want to know more about Orbit Lab, you're very welcome to reach out. And finally, we do host a number of other events online at the moment, and all of you are welcome to att attend those as well. So in May, we have these events coming up, and you can find the uh, details of them on our website and our social media. And I will also post links to these events in the chat afterwards. So uh, that's it from me. I will now leave you in the capable hands of Hugo. Over to you, Hugo. Okay, thank you for the introduction, uh, Lida. I'll share uh, my screen. Uh, eventually, you're seeing my slides now. Yes. Great. So uh, it's an honor to be hosting the Live from Behind the Walls. Uh, it's a, a, a series of seminars that we are really proud to, to host uh, here at Aarhus University. Uh, before we start, a bit of announcements. So uh, please turn off your cameras and microphones uh, unless you're the speaker uh, at the uh, respective slot. Uh, feel free to post questions in the chat along the way. Present yourself, so who you are, what, how are you interested in uh, uh, your research in cyber physical systems, digital twins and digital research and innovation. Um, if you're posing questions to the speakers, uh, remember to uh, uh, post your name and the na or post the name of the speaker because indeed um, they will reply after the finishing their talk. So for the speakers themselves, uh, be ready to share your slides a bit before your, your, your talk. We, we are running a, a packed uh, uh, schedule. Uh, and uh, if you see me turn my camera when you're, uh, then you, you know that your time is uh, nearly up. So it's a good time for the wrapping up of your talk. So thank you all for joining. Uh, we expect you to uh, enjoy uh, the live session for today. We have two hours of uh, exciting talks uh, on the uh, in the area of digital twins, cyber physical systems, and digital innovation. Uh, I highlighted the names of the people that work uh, within Aarhus University, and in specific, the people that are working in the group of cyber physical systems uh, that is led by Peter Gorn Larson, uh, like Lita said, uh, one of the main uh, mentors of this seminar. So today, uh, some of uh, our postdocs and uh, uh, Paidi Lee, uh, one of our PhD students uh, that is uh, soon to graduate, uh, 11 of 2021, as I see in the image there, uh, will present uh, uh, their works and works they are doing within projects that uh, um, are uh, somehow like kind of uh, the um, uh, sponsors of the great research that we do together. So we, we thank to uh, the funding agencies and to these projects the ability of doing this research and being able to be uh, doing collaboration here at Aarhus University. So for instance, Digit Brain, uh, Prasad is, will probably present his work that uh, he's uh, doing uh, in that project. Casper uh, and the Digital Twins fr uh, Framework comes uh, from uh, funding from the uh, Poldu Jensen Foundation from the Grundfos. Uh, and um, Mirgeta will probably present or will present work from the Aero Robotic Fleet, that uh, sh pro a project that she's in uh, uh, as well. So. Uh, back to the program, 
uh, after this short introduction, indeed, we have Prasad presenting his work in uh, uh, manufacturing uh, in the Digital Brain uh, project. Uh, after that, we have Anela. Uh, she's a special speaker. She's external from the group. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, I thank her personally because I personally challenge her to be here. So uh, she works um, uh, within uh, the area of uh, digital twins for water. And uh, in fact, uh, she's uh, based in Vincent Sud, uh, a water utility in Odense here in Denmark. And she's doing her PhD uh, uh, in um, uh, DTU. And hopefully she will like, kind of uh, tell us all about digital twins in the water sector. Um, which will be followed by a talk by Casper, uh, uh, a member of our uh, group, um, which, which will present uh, joint work uh, with Kenneth that is currently employed at ACO, but he's uh, uh, a long-standing or so like kind of, he was a member of the group and uh, they will present work that they're doing in terms of uh, defining a future digital twin platform uh, developed in-house. Uh, following that, we have Mergida, uh, Megeda will present her work uh, uh, on fault ejection for co simulation. Uh, uh, I'm uh, proudly a collaborator of this of the group that is working on this direction. After that, another hot topic in cyber physical systems uh, is robots. So we have Emil uh, telling us ten, telling us about modeling and calibration of robots, um, which will be followed by by D. Uh, that will show us like kind of her PhD work, which uh, nicely combines architecture and formal reasoning. Um, and um, after that, uh, we have the two last talks that are um, uh, external uh, members uh, presenting that we thank a lot. So we have a, a student project, like kind of a, a web app that uh, has um, that is applied in uh, protecting bees and like kind of detecting uh, dust mites in bees uh, or mites in, in beehives. So quite an interesting like kind of uh, 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 application. Uh, for for research, and um, uh, that will be followed by a startup from also from the Aarhus University startup uh, ecosystem, uh, where a startup that like kind of uh, um, uses cyber physical systems in the context of bio industries. So uh, Concibio uh, and Yuan uh, will tell us all about it. So. Um, next uh, event is June the 30th. Um, Please feel free to contact us if you want to present there. Uh, also, like kind of, if you have any um, uh, point for discussion in terms of research and future collaboration, just drop a message to Peter, Lida, or uh, myself. Um, without further ado, uh, I think we are ready for the next talk. Uh, Prasad, uh, if you are um, around, uh, as I hope, uh, yes, you can I have the floor. Thank you. And you should be able to see my you can see my screen yep and uh, you can also see back to yep. okay now we see yes it. yeah okay so Great. you got uh thank you for the introduction uh good afternoon everyone uh so this is a short presentation on more of applications of digital twin uh, rather than the software and the things that are being developed in the group. So the context for this project is to see how digital twins can enable manufacturing at a large scale uh, by having active collaboration between the manufacturers and then uh, the users within the industry rather than the end users themselves. So that's why it's mentioned as SMEs. But the background is the digital twins and the, all the th things that go along with it. So the broader idea, I mean, if I were to kind of take it from the manufacturers and then their users in the industry. So that's the context in this context. So you take any industrial product that you kind of put in into place and you take the life, life cycle of that industrial product and take different stages. So starting from the conception, production, distribution, operation, and then all the way to recycling. So all through the phases, how do you improve, keep track of, and then feed it back into the recycle? So all of this problem, uh, again, in the context of Digital Twin, has been divided into four fundamental components. 
So one, we think of it as the data that's essential for conceptualization and doing doing the entire product thing. And then the models that are necessary for having the digital trends in place and then the software or we call them abstractly as algorithms that you need to execute models along with data. Of course, uh, algorithms, alias software in this case, doesn't execute in vacuum. You need computing resources for all of it. So, so these we think of as four fundamental components that you bring together in order to have digital trends for the entire product life cycle. So how do we go about it? Like I already mentioned that there are three fundamental things. I'm not showing the execution infrastructure here, but as we go along, I will highlight that as well. So the core idea, apart from having these four components, is to enable the distal twins for different life cycles of the product. So that means whatever the distal twin you have for the design stage, might not be appropriate for the operations stage, which might not be appropriate for the recycling stage. So we take model data and data and algorithm, and we have a set of models that are appropriate for a product and different data uh, data uh, points that come into the product and different execution softwares that you might have. So you can pair them up in a meaningful way, and the only restriction is. Anytime you pair them up, they should be appropriate for the uh, product lifecycle. I mean, wherever the product is being used and the corresponding operating conditions, the digital twin has to be formed based on appropriate set tuple of data model and algorithm. Now, all of these uh, are used together to form what we call, sorry, what we call as a digital product brain. Is it, uh, so that basically is the one that helps that's a digital twin of the product. It's not just a digital shadow, but it's a two way thing. So it's a di uh, digital product brain. So we keep all of this in the ecosystem of digital Agora, which is basically a marketplace. And the nice thing that's done is. This evolution of the product brain is based on the events and then the significant uh, rules and inferences that you make on these events in the context of these digital twins. So the product brain is being evolved and the models come and go algorithms come and go but the the industrial product is still being actively tracked and controlled from the digital twin so again how do you, how can one as a participant provide and derive value from this context one uh, you can provide model and if you have interesting data for an industrial machine you can provide that or if you have a software that can execute a model, you can provide that as well. So the software vendors come in, manufacturers can come in with their models of their industrial product and the customers can provide the data or manufacturer can provide the model data for some of the algorithms like machine learning algorithms. So it's a bunch of stakeholders coming together to solve each other's problems. So how do we again? I've mentioned broadly the overview. Now, what kind of things that we're putting in place in order to solve this problem? Uh, we've said there are three components: uh, data model and algorithms. Again, the nice thing about platform is it sort of uh, accommodates things coming from outside because there are huge intellectual property issues that go with all of these three components. The system itself doesn't store any of them, so these three are defined by some external authoring tools or the users themselves if it's manual process. And then those assets exist outside of the platform and you have a registry that basically keeps track of these external assets. So asset provider as and when they want, as and when they are ready, they publish and then the registry keeps getting updated along the way. So what happens once you have registry? Obviously, you have to use these three components to create a distal twin. So you can see at the top there is a distal twin with these three components. Now, these three components have to be dynamically shuffled around. That I will get to a little bit 
later, but you can see that there is a component registry which is helping you manage it. But this registry, now uh, broadly speaking, maybe we need to evolve the term and we, uh, whatever rectangular box you see here, we are calling it broadly uh, digit brain asset administration shell. So that's sort of like bringing everything together. So there has to be someone who takes this digital twin and executes it on an infrastructure. So for us, uh, this execution engine uh, specification is at a very high level. There is a YAML based specification where we say take these uh, assets and execute them in specific environment and those environments can be local right near the industrial product or if that is not sufficient, you can push it to a cluster or the cloud high performance cluster or even the cloud resources and that's already being supported now. Now I've mentioned about uh, again the composition or bringing together a tuple of it. So let me just show you where that tuple is coming from. If you look at the very top, uh, you have this notion of digital product brain and you have uh, composable three things of data model and algorithms coming in. And for every industrial product, which we call it as industrial product instance, you have an a specific instance of digital uh, product brain. And that instance is a proper digital twin. I mean, evolving digital twin for one industrial product. And if you have thousand of them, you will have thousand digital brains for one for each of the industrial products. And what do these do? I mean, based on the events that are coming from events and the uh, specific data points that are coming in, the platform uh, coordinates and passes on those events all the way to the instance and instance uh, process them, infers those events and then sends specific control messages, which again go all the way to the product, industrial product. Now, so here if we take away all the other co contributing components, I abstracted a lot of things out. We have the solution I mentioned about the product brain and then there is the platform that is responsible for stringing together all of these and then there is a marketplace. So this is a marketplace for all of these uh, assets. We mentioned about data, we mentioned about algorithms, we mentioned about models and someone can also sell their uh, infrastructure. Uh, so all of that is put on the marketplace and users can come and use it. So this is basically a usage, how you go from requirements to creation of those assets and then publish and then use. So it's a basic cycle which we use in this brain project to publish and use and reuse assets. Now, just to give you a flavor of how things go, here is a, an ongoing experiment in the digit brain project. This is a specific case of agro interly uh, that th that has on field roboty and how they keep track of preventive maintenance and how we link it with their factory to see manufacturing of a part all the way to factory and its updates. So we have the corresponding digit brain view of those things. We have a digital twin for each of the on field roboty. We have a digital twin for the factory and there is a data that's coming in from outside and that's put in a common database that both Rob Roboti and the factory use. So, and it's optional in DigitBrain project, but uh, quite a few of the experiments and use cases have the 3D visualization as well, and the platform supports it. So we have, in this case, we have algorithms, one of which is actually contributed by AU, other one is coming from our Romanian partner, we have users contributing data. Model comes from the agro intel itself, their robot model, and then the optional user interface again is contributed by how from AU and Daniel from Romania, ULB is Romania. So you can see that different partners are bringing their, their components and putting them together to solve a very specific problem. Now this is a UI for the factory and this is the UI for the roboty. Again, UI is not fundamentally required, but quite a few of the experiments are bringing that in place, so the platform supports it. So again, to summarize, we have DigitBrain, which 
keeps an evolvable digital twin and that has four fundamental assets. One is data, other one is model, third one is algorithm, and the fourth one is infrastructure. And all four of these assets can be brought in by the complementary partners and they can work together, create a value and derive value, both uh, socially and economically. So here you can see the typical providers of uh, data and then the vendors of the software and then the models. You also have infrastructure providers which can derive commercial benefit out of it. So if you see some value for you, and we consider it exciting, but if you see value for yourself, there is an ongoing open call in this project, so please participate. So I am here. Hugo, it's over to you. Thank you for your attention. Great. So um, we uh, are really on time, and uh, that means that uh, if uh, Aneta is uh, in the area already, uh, we can just uh, switch to her. Yeah. So after the Digit Brain project, we have Aneta talking about digital twins in the water sector. We see your slides, Aneta. So are you ready? You see my screen now? Yep. Yes, okay. So I will talk about digital swings in the, in the water sector. Um, uh, I'm from uh, this company called uh, VCS Denmark, um, which are located at uh, Fynen uh, in Odense and uh, North Fyn. Um, yeah, and we have uh, this uh, water sector and we have uh, uh, the waterworks and the distribution that we take care of and uh, distribute water to our customers, but we also take out uh, the, the 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 wastewater and the rainwater from uh, the system, and uh, then finally we also have the the water resource recovery facility where we treat uh, the wastewater. Um, I specifically work with uh, urban drainage systems, uh, where we have this uh, wastewater going into the pipes. Uh, we have some infiltration to the ground, and this infiltration uh, or the the terrestrial uh, groundwater can also infiltrate to the pipes uh, because the pipe is not always uh, that's that tight uh, as we think they are. Um, and then we have the rainfall, uh, which can end up in the combined system, then it goes together with the wastewater, or it's a separate system, and then it uh, goes out uh, to the recipients uh, without. Uh, mixing with the wastewater. Uh, and finally, if the, the pipes are, are near um, or they are uh, full running, then we can have a uh, overflow to the to the recipients um, um, in order not to have it in, in the basement of uh, people's houses. And it's a very complex system because we have this uh, stochastic input um, from our rain gauges, uh, that's the, the circles uh, in these pictures, and the other one is the radar, and most uh, utilities don't have a radar, they have uh, uh, rain gauges. And as you can see here, the uh, the rain gauges do not, does not at all co uh, the ca capture this uh, rain event. Uh, so so we have a difficulty, uh, difficult uh, um, uh, replicating the, the events sometimes because we have this stochastic input uh, as rain. And besides that, we are also um, having this service level that we should try to to keep that we only have flooding on terrain every five to ten years. And of course, this is a rarely observation, so we have to uh, extrapolate our data and see, OK, because we cannot uh, measure all places uh, for five to ten years uh, to capture this one event that we are going to build our system after. We also have a very uh, complex, uh, or uh, no, we have a, a changing behavior of our system as, uh, for example, the pump, which are clocked here. Uh, so that can uh, make uh, the digital swim modeling uh, become hard, but we also have a sediment or uh, um, things in our sewer systems uh, that, that, uh, that ends up here. And you can also see we have actually an overflow in, in I don't know if you see my mouse, but uh, uh, in, we see in, it. We, you see it, okay. Uh, because here you have a screen uh, from uh, to the overflow, so so we don't have too much uh, um, uh, large stuff into uh, the the recipients. 
but here we, it is simply clogged with the uh, sediments. Uh, so what is the level of this uh, overflow? Um, and and the, the two last pictures is uh, that, that we actually have a quite nice uh, pipe here. And uh, then we had a very, really, really dry uh, summer and uh, the pipe simply cracked. And suddenly we have a lot of infiltration into this system. And we would like to, uh, sorry, I just have a kid who is sick. So yeah, um, but um, yeah, we would like to uh, to know these kind of problems uh, bef uh, when we maintain our system and when we operate our system before uh, so so that we don't have so much infiltration into our system for several days before without our that we know it. Um, so we have a lot of exchange uh, with water with their uh, with their environment uh, and we have to deal with that and that is one of our challenges. So just briefly, uh, who am I? Uh, I am a Master of Science uh, in 2019 and then I have uh, 10 years of experience uh, in the as a uh, hydraulic modeling expert uh, and then, then I um, signed up for this uh, uh, PhD project, So uh, which I'm finishing next year. So what we need was that that we have these models of our system and, and this is what we built our construction um, after. Uh, so we have a model, we simulate something and then we build the stuff. But when the model does not replicate the reality, then it becomes uh, kind of hard. Uh, and we have done a lot. We have uh, really looked into our asset databases. Can we update it and how can we transfer this uh, automatically to the to the models? And uh, we have some observation, a lot of rain gauges. Uh, we have a lot of level and flow meters and we have the, all these analyzers. But, but even though that we tried a lot, uh, all these puzzle pieces did not match the reality and and that was kind of frustrating so so um so now we looked into this uh, digital twin uh, theory uh, and I hope that uh, that it will help us uh, along the way um and and we are really inspired by this Finnish group uh, which uh, looked into this uh, feature based uh, digital twin framework uh, where we have a lot of things uh, connected with via data links um, and 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 then uh, providing a digital twin. We think that the most important part of this is uh, the fiscal or the coupling to the fiscal uh, system, all the data links that the data can flow in between, and the simulation model. But before I continue, I have to say that we still, and I think you all of you agree, that we need a common consensus of what makes it a digital twin. Uh, and which features uh, are needed in a digital win because should it be everything or just uh, a few things and where is the um what is what is um, the minimum requirement uh, of a digital win so this we need to tackle all of, all of us uh, for the different industries but coming back to the simulation models because that's what i'm particularly interested in uh, we have found out that that we can uh, give a different uh, simulations models. So if we have different, or we have different simulations models for different purposes in the system. So we have some which are living uh, because we do not have instances. We don't have many replication of a sewer system. We have one sewer system which will last forever. So we call it a living uh, digital twin. And then we have prototyping where we, we plan something new and we design something new. And and both of these uh, classifications um, are based on these attributes and the observations in the systems uh, or in the system. And then we can have operation um, in the in the living and, and we need a really high five uh, models for this because we need uh, to uh, to operate in, uh, in several places uh, in the system. Uh, and we also need to know where the water is in detail. And then we have a uh, control. We can have a control mo model uh, if we want to uh, control uh, how the when the actuators should do this and that. Uh, then typically we have a lo-fi model, uh, with, which could be a neural network or something like this. Uh, then we have design models where we uh, take out 
all the knowledge from the operation and put it into uh, a more design with with maybe some other parameters. Um, and then we have design models, um, also high five, and then we have these low fi or the simple models providing uh, what can we say about a system if we do if we uh, separate everything or if we uh, make such elements in this area, then we can have some planning. So there are different kind of models in a digital twin, and we think also that we can have uh, four different. Uh, simulation models or digital twins in one digital twin environment. That's at least what we aim for. Um, but for now, we are looking at the operation uh, model in the living digital twin because we think that we can learn from this uh, uh, operation model to uh, and put this in uh, knowledge into the plan and design um, models that we have. Um, excuse me, it's a uh, home office and I just have a kid. Hi, Blik. Yeah, come on. Sorry. <laughs> um, no worries. Um, so, um, and, and, and why we are looking into is this is to, because we need to gain trust in our digital twin that, that the simulation model can actually also, um, um, show um, give us the results that we expect because if not then then there is no trust in this uh, digital twin and we have a uh, we have we need to trust that that uh, our simulation models works um, in in different situation or at least explain when and where not they uh, can work so i uh, looked into my organization and asked a lot of people uh, what they uh, wanted from this digital twin, and they um, uh, we have an operation and maintenance part, and and they wanted a lot of uh, predictive maintenance. Uh, they would would like to have uh, real time uh, monitoring, so they know what's happening right now in different locations, uh, and also uh, to understand the, the inflow of the treatment plant, uh, the investment and business development are more uh, handling uh, planning and design, and and of course they they wanted better models, so it's not um, so so that we invest uh, that we built the, the right uh, constructions and thereby not saving money but invest smarter and then we can uh, use the money smarter um, and overall uh, all of these uh, can give uh, transparency into each other's work but also into um, what is um, w how the model the model work but also the system work so we can get this transparency but in the inside and the overview and then we also have a common goal across our department uh, departments um, which we find is uh, quite uh, interesting to have so uh, we are trying to bring this the digital swim alive we have a, a simple digital swim running right now but we would like to expand this uh, a lot more so there's a lot of work to do uh, I would look into this uh, trust in in the models behind, but we have the predictive maintenance. Uh, we need some tools. We need some visual visualizations. We need reactive, simple planning tools, uh, also called uh, what if analysis. Maybe we need assisted supervision for some of the operation things, uh, operation uh, people. Uh, and we also need to uh, deal with all this alarm because that's one of the, the thing that we often hear here is that we can have this tool and then you get a lot of alarms, but we drown in alarms. So how to prioritize. Um, and everything will be supported by a digital ecosystem. Like I think that uh, maybe, uh, I hope that the next uh, uh, presentation also will uh, look into. I, I'm yeah uh, let's see um yeah and if you're interested in all of this then uh, we had a paper out uh, with the uh, with uh, this uh, that i just told you about and uh, we also just got uh, an open review paper with a lot of data uh, so if you wanted to work with the uh, with the uh, urban drainage systems and digital swims or anything uh, within urban drainage system then we have a lot of data and uh, some models uh, that you can play around with yes Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Aneta. It was a, a really good presentation. So if there's uh, people interested in the audience and in like kind of students about data in water, uh, please contact us. Um, and uh, I think uh, we are in, in time. So if Casper is already around, uh, we could just uh, switch to him. And uh, thank you very much, Aneta, for uh, uh, joining us. And uh, I hope that uh, everything is all right uh, back there. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it is OK now. <laughs> so. OK, great. Thank you very much. So, Hello, uh, everyone. Is this Casper? Oh, yeah. hi, Casper. Uh, uh, is my presentation on? Uh, we see the Teams uh, GUI, not the presentation itself, but we see your screen. It, is that better? Ah, yeah, now we see it. Then I just. You have the floor. Yeah. Good, good. Good luck. Thanks. So, uh, I actually found the presentation just before to be the, the perfect one to come before this, because I'm going to try and talk about our work on a digital twin platform. So what is a digital twin? I'm just going to start very briefly. Uh, it is when the data flows between an existing physical object and a digital object. So this means that if something changes in the physical object, then it also changes in a digital object. Now it, it goes both ways. That's the difference between a digital twin and a digital shadow. With a digital twin, you also have some communication the other way around. So uh, I can only the before me, oops, sorry, just mentioned uh, a lot of these things like 3D visualization or just visualization, safety monitoring, predictive maintenance, fault diagnosis, support for decision making, and self reconfiguration. Uh, so, some terminology is that the hardware we call plant and the software on the physical twin is called the controller. Just some terminology. So, this sounds pretty good. Like uh, Osvan just said, we would like to build one. So the first thing is you don't really know how to get started building a digital twin because there are so many papers out there and there are so many technologies involved. So the first thing you can do is you can start to read. And here you can see there are quite a lot of definitions of a digital twin. Here are a lot of papers without definition. So go ahead. Uh, the internet is yours. Then you read, then you start building a bit and you repeat. So read, build, repeat. And this goes on for some time. And then you figure out this wasn't really the approach. You're not really getting where you want it to be. So what do you do then? You're sort of back to where you started. This is where we hope to come in. We want to create a digital print twin platform that consists of not only tooling, but also methodology. Something like, what do we actually want? What are the actual features that we want for our digital twin? And then the obvious the next step, what are the steps we have to, to take to actually get what we want? So some structure you need to realize some experiments in order to get your models uh, with a high fidelity according to the real world and then you also have the, the a very difficult step of a digital twin is actually to get the thing running because like you saw in the uh, in the figures before there are a lot of different tooling involved in a digital twin and a lot of links between the different tools so just getting the things up and running and initialized correctly is also a big thing so what we hope to accompany this digital twin platform is teaching material. Since we are a university and we have a lot of students, we need to uh, make the students aware of digital twins and how to handle digital twins. We want to create examples, meaning that when you actually take a digital twin platform example, then it actually works and you can you have a, a clear understanding of what goes where, which things are linked to which things. We want to have uh, programming libraries so you can actually use this. And we are thinking about making project templates. This means that if you want to start building a digital twin, but you don't really know how to get started, then you download a tool which create uh, and it asks you some questions and you get a project template. So this is sort of uh, sort of getting started on a digital twin, a lot of this. And the reason for this is that we also see a lot of companies transitioning into a digital twin. And just presenting a framework with 100 pieces also for the students will be a bit much. So hopefully this will help. So for some methodology, in the always event case, it's uh, they have the hardware first, obviously. But uh, what are what are the steps you should take? Do you create the hardware first of a digital twin if you're starting from scratch? Do you create the software first? Do you create the models first and then make the hardware fit the models? How do you ensure the fidelity between the the models in the virtual world and the physical uh, realization of them? When you have an improvement to make. How do you test it in the virtual world first and then deploy it to the hardware in the 
in a good fashion? And then how do you manage traceability? So as you can probably understand from, from all of this and also from the presentation before, you will have a lot of models, you will have a lot of hardware, you will have a lot of different bits and bolts, and all of these will have to be somewhat traced. So you, some of you might have seen this before. This is sort of our initial digital twin case study. Uh, it consists of an incubator, which is sort of an insulated box with a, a heater, and it has a fan just to circulate the air. It has a temperature sensor here on the right side and has the temperature sensor at the top, and then it has a temperature outside the box that you cannot see. What we have done is that we connected it to a Raspberry Pi to get something quick and, and simple. Oops. Also to uh, also to, to make it easy for other people to try out. So you can read more details about this from a, from a technical report by Hao Feng. So if you look a bit on the structure, the, the initial structure that we are working on is actually somewhat simple. In the virtual world, you will have your models and you will have your experiments. An experiment can, for example, be a parameter estimation. Say you have uh, some hardware, which is the next step, it's target related, uh, and you've done profiling as an experiment, which means that you have your hardware and you test something. Uh, it, for example, for the heat bed, you try to heat it up for 30 seconds. Now you have some models that might not fit perfectly, but when you did your your calculation, for example, when you did your models, you knew that you had some parameters, for example, energy transferred from the heat bed to air, and these are some of the parameters you have to estimate. So this means you have to link the experiment conducted in the virtual world with the profiling conducted in the physical. So in the virtual world, you have models, experiments. In the physical, you have hardware. You also have software to put on the hardware. In some case, you have hardware that is not electronics related. Uh, then you have experiments, for example, the profiling. And then you have what we call the sort of digital twin layer. This is where you have the combination of these two. For example, an active calibration consists of a profiling operation and a parameter estima estimation. So the digital twin will also have software to tie these two worlds together. Then, of course, we have all the other bits and bolts like we talked about earlier, all the utilities, the infrastructure, the traceability, if you need to export your models to, uh, to different standards and so forth. So just to, uh, to recap or to give an example of, a, of an experiment we have conducted or Claudio Gomez and how Feng have conducted and we are trying to, to put in this defined structure. You want, you want your experiment to ensure the model fidelity between the hardware and the plant models. So the hardware experiment is to define and then deploy the profiling experiment to the target and then you need, which we call physical, and then you need to record the experiment. Now this is some, some infrastructure. All of this has been automated currently and we, we, are, not, uh, we are working on making, making all of it automated uh, and presentable, but the parts where we have, a, we have a special package that is ultimately packaged and deployed to the hardware and executed has been carried out. So the virtual experiment is then to define and execute a model fidelity experiment, which is in, in this case, it's simulation. Uh, then you need to evaluate this against the hardware experiment. Perhaps you need to update the model. Perhaps you did not have enough parameters in the model. Uh, and then you have to perform the parameter estimation. Again, you need to record the experiment. You have to be completely sure of what experiment you conducted, when and where, and what resources were involved. Again, it's the traceability part. So this is an example of something that we will, will put in the methodology section, for example, but it will be accompanied by examples showing here is a model which was developed in a different section. We can go read about that. And here is the, the profiling. So after you have conducted many experiments, what you end up in the virtual world is that you have a collection of models related to the physical system and the controller. On the physical, you probably have a software application with drivers, controller, communication, or you might also have some other hardware. With the digital twin, you will have a lot of experiments, which basically consist of combining the running target software with a running simulation. This is what we really want. We want to be able to connect the real system with our virtual system. So again, the hardware profiling I was mentioned earlier, the, the way we have initiated uh, or started doing this is that we have created a scenario or an experiment we call profiling. Now the scenario is that we want to, uh, to start the recorder. We want to wait 10 seconds so we get a stable state of the system. We want to turn on the heater for 30 seconds. We want to keep recording for five minutes and then we want to stop recording. 
basically this gives us the hardware profiling. So all of this is carried out via RabbitMQ running on the uh, running on our software where we have uh, some software which is automatically packed, packaged into a package and then deployed on the Raspberry Pi. This again communicates with RabbitMQ. So you have the hardware and the scenario communicating via RabbitMQ and finally we get a result. So the output of a of the output of such an experiment is the scenario, in this case this the, the recipe sort of a resource identification, for example, which software resources were in this package, which version were we running of the hardware, and then obviously the result. And all of this will have to go into a traceability database with history. Also, so you can, when you create new uh, controllers and stuff, you can try it out on old data. So here is a result of an experiment, just to give you an indication of it. As you can see here, we turn on the heat bed, and then we uh, ramp up and then the heat started uh, start going up. It's the average temperature and time in seconds. Yeah. So for the last thing is, this is based on a Python-based digital twin framework. So currently it is tool support, but not con configuration-based. So this means that you will have to develop some Python code. Uh, Python is our initial, initial, uh, initial start of this. And the reason why we chose Python is that we have a lot of uh, people interested in what we're doing. We have uh, researchers, we have students, and we also have industry. So Python is relatively simple to get started with, and there are a lot of resources available. And we hope that it's it's easy for students to get into, but also for, for companies to, to maybe tailor it a bit to their approach. So the idea is that we want to make sort of a, an open-ended tool chain, which will be Python-based. This does not mean that you cannot include all other sorts of languages, technologies, all that sort of stuff, but we believe this might be the best way to uh, to support all, all three of uh, industry, research, and students. So what we plan on doing here is that we want to take the incubator towards a, a full digital twin. So this means that it will consist of a methodology, it will consist of a full example, it will consist of a lot of models, uh, it will consist of a way to automatically deploy it to hardware, a description of how to set up local experiments related to this, and basically transition into a full digital twin, where we also have fault detection, some idea on how to handle the many alarms, because I also I agree with Avnade that this is definitely an issue that has to be tackled. Uh, and this is also something where it can be very difficult to get the configuration-based approach completely correct. Uh, but the configuration based approach will be good in the future because it's a lot easier for traceability if your, all of your experiments are just stored in a configuration file. So we also plan to do demonstrations of this where we actually uh, package this into one package and can take, it, can take it different places and show it and explain how it goes on. We want to clean it up such that we don't have our research examples lying around, but we actually have a clean example. We want to create some teaching material with exercises. And then we also would like to try to work on taking these models that we developed in Python and give an approach on how these can be uh, code generated or packaged differently so they can be used in different standards. Our standard, uh, our current favorite standard, so to speak, the one we use uh, a lot of and create a lot of tooling around is the functional mockup standard. And Christian Lego has done a lot of tremendous work on, on uh, compiling uh, or, or wrapping Python models so they can be used as functional mockup units. So then we want to do FMI-based co-simulation Maestro 2, which means that we are actually shifting a bit from the tool-supported Python version into a more config-based version, where you have a lot of different tools that can export these FMUs. We also have a digital twin project goes on with a desktop robot, which is basically a small robot with four wheels in a desktop size. Uh, and we will also attempt to apply this framework on this case study. So we will have some different case studies to, to base this on. So uh, this is this is not only the work by me. It's also uh, I think I forgot to name it in the beginning. It's also by Claudio Gomez, How Thing, and Kenneth Lausdale, Peter Gom Larsen, and other people at AU involved. So thank you. Thank you very much, Casper. You did a good liaison. Uh, so from Odense, Invent uh, Center Sud to Aarhus, and I hope that uh, our next uh, journey uh, driver, Megida, is ready for her talk. Are you around, Megida? 
Yes, I'm here. That's great. And you can do the talk now, or yeah, yeah. we can do a pause. But yeah, great. Yeah, so, uh, sure. you have the just, floor. Uh, just let me get the slides up and ready. That's good. I'll check if they are online. Uh, we see your desktop and we see your slides in it. Good yes. luck for your talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, hi everyone. I'm Yergita. I'm a postdoc here at AU. And today I will be talking to you about the fault injection mechanisms uh, we have developed here for cost simulation. And actually, some of my uh, collaborators are here, like Hugo and Casper. Before we get into the specifics of that, though, uh, I would like to start talking to you about what is uh, more of a general goal or the bigger picture for which this is useful and uh, uh, that makes this fault injection uh, aspect important for us. So I'm involved in the agro-robotic fleet project, which was mentioned a bit uh, briefly by Hugo in the beginning. So what we want to do here is basically deliver solutions, uh, a fleet solution for agricultural uh, operations. We have this uh, field robots named the Robotis that are developed by AgroIntelli, which uh, are our partners in this project. So what we want to do is basically to deploy different routes and different task plans to these uh, robots that are then to be performed autonomously in the field. And eventually these robots might uh, need to communicate with one another. For example, consider the case of an obstacle popping up all of a sudden, and then this information can be e exchanged uh, between the robots within the co their communication range. And once everything is done and achieved, then uh, we reach our goal of uh, having our farmer here that is all happy. So we want to achieve all of this, and then we want to achieve it in a safe way. And this safe, uh, the safe word here is quite uh, crucial for us. So what does it mean, though, for my work and for the work that we are doing here at EU? So how is our, uh, what is our place in this, uh, in this machination? So we want to be able to, to run uh, and simulate different scenarios in which we can play with different condition, execution conditions, for example, with a number of robots, with the obstacles that so we could have, like static obstacles, but also dynamic ones, uh, terrain or weather conditions, should they be available. But also we are interested in evaluating this, uh, the execution of this fleet in the presence of faults. So we want to see how the system behaves and does it reach a safe state as it should? Uh, the, the, how are, are the fault tolerance mechanism present uh, performing? So where did we start from? So we started from the Arco simulation wor uh, world, which is here on the left side. And what we have here is basically a depiction of the into CPS application, which is allowing you to couple different um, models that are coming from different tools, to couple them in a co-model and then run a cost simulation uh, with all of with, uh, these different components orchestrated by a uh, orchestration engine such as the Maestro that Casper uh, mentioned. So all of these different models are uh, basically packaged as an uh, FMU, which is this, uh, which is abiding the FMI, FMI standard. Then on the real world, and then here it's in quotation marks because for for the for this context, what the real world means here is what is external to this cost simulation world. We can either have the desk, the robotic, which is the big robot that will work on the field, or the desktop robotic, as mentioned previously. Or we could have actually uh, a simulation uh, in, in gazebo. We we had a way to kind of we have a way to kind of send data back and forth between between these two systems. So then, in order to kind of be able to run these different cost simula different simulations or to run different experiments in which we are injecting fault, so basically what we needed was this fault injection uh, mechanisms that, that was helping us to to tamper with uh, with the FMUs. So how does a very simple example look like? Uh, we can have a scenario like this. We have four different FMUs. We have specified the different inputs and outputs and different connections. So we want in the easy way possible to kind of uh, mess up uh, with these inputs and to kind of put a bit of strain on the on the system. So what we did here was to realize this uh, small plugin 
which can uh, which is based on Maestro and can be is used with Maestro, which allows us to to wrap any FMU uh, to which we want to inject any faults. And uh, co we configure this wrapper through an XML file in which we define all the different events. So an event is specified by the time in which it should happen and which of these uh, inputs it should actually be be affecting. So during any normal uh, times or any normal situations in which we don't want to have any faults, then this will just serve as a proxy. But then once we have something that we want to inject, once we have some value that we want to inject, these will be uh, passed on to the actual FMU and from which we do then expect to see uh, misbehavior. So what have we done so far with it? Uh, we have been doing some initial experiments and I will be showing you here today uh, one set of these experiments. Let's go a bit back in the figure that we saw before. So now imagine that in our simulation world we have a safety distance monitor and what this does is takes as inputs the a position of the, of the robot and a position of the of an obstacle. Uh, th then it is calculating the distance between these two and in case this uh, distance is smaller than some threshold that we have defined ourselves, then it is going to send an emergency stop to the robot. So here then on the real world, uh, or uh, as close to it as you can get here. We have uh, the gazebo simulation uh, of the roboti, and here we are also able to kind of put up uh, an obstacle wherever we want and drive the robot around. So what we did was to basically inject our fault into the safety distance monitor and specifically by tampering with the position of the obstacle such that it is actually seems further, uh, further away than, uh, than it actually is. So this looks a bit like this, the, the results of these experiments. We can see like on the left side, the normal behavior and on the right side, the faulty behavior, specifically in this uh, red shaded area that we have there. We can see that we have determined the safety distance threshold to 10 meters and in this uh, red dotted line in both graphs. The calculated distance in our monitor is the solid blue line, whereas the real distance is this non green dotted line. And then we can see also, uh, we can follow this magenta line, which represents the moment where uh, uh, the emergency stop is sent to the robot. So this happens while the stop command gets the value of one. So you can actually see on the uh, right side y axis to, to check the values of that. So in the left side, we have the normal behavior, uh, what, we, what we expect uh, to happen. And we can see that the calculated distance is following the real distance, whereas in the other side, and here is the case where we have injected our fault in the uh, position of the obstacle, we can see that actually the robot uh, will not be stopping and by from time 20 to further, it's like it will be actually pushing the obstacle in the simulation. As soon as we leave though this uh, injected, uh, val uh, these faulty values that are being injected, then uh, we see immediately the re correct response of the system in which it will send this emergency stop and everything will stop. So you may say, okay, all this sounds interesting. So, but how are we different then? I mean, uh, what are we bringing that is uh, new and, and interesting? And we have to kind of uh, ground this in the context of cost simulation. And here, uh, this mechanism it's quite simple but quite powerful in a way that uh, we don't need to add any artifacts in the system model we don't really need to uh, do any code regeneration so you don't have to touch the fmu uh, the inner workings of the FMU at all and we there are no additional external tools needed so this is something that works seamless, seamlessly with a maestro and is based on maestro so, so far, uh, the experiments that we have done have been a bit of toy experiments just to kind of uh, show a proof of concept of what we can do with this uh, plugin mechanism. But what we want to do next uh, is a little bit more sophisticated in a way. Uh, and if we can go back to this figure again, then here we are able to see uh, on the right side in the real world now is a desktop robotic that Casper mentioned. And it's something that we can use to play around uh, in the office. And on the left side, we have our co-simulation world now in which we want to place the controller for the robot and in, uh, to which we want to uh, inject different faulty values that could be representative, for example, of bad sensor values. 
uh, as an example. And in this case, we also have the safety distance monitor, which is uh, the re represents the fault tolerant mechanism in this in this context. And uh, we want to uh, evaluate the system in this uh, faulty condition. And with this, I would like to conclude uh, this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk, Brigida. Yeah. So uh, we are still a bit ahead of schedule. Uh, so if Emil is around and he wants to push it, uh, we could just like kind of have his talk already. Otherwise, we can go for a 10 minute pause. Yeah, are you already around, Emil? Yes, I am. Are you prepared for your talk? Yes. So good luck, good Emil. Uh, talk us about robots. Yes. So hello everyone, my name is Emil and I'll talk about modeling and calibration of robots. So in today's society, industrial robots are used in a lot of applications. So uh, in many applications, you also need to have some kind of uh, real-time sanity checking of the system. So for instance, uh, the robot could follow some trajectory and you could uh, evaluate of whether the occurrence of its uh, electric actuators actually correspond to what you would expect. And if that's not the case, uh, is, is it because we hit a human coworker? Or alternatively, maybe the friction uh, changed over time or something else. Uh, so to be able to answer these questions, uh, one must have an accurate dynamic model of the robot uh, to start with. Uh, so in this presentation, I'll explain how to obtain this accurate uh, dynamic model of the robot and how to calibrate the model parameters based on the experimental data. So this uh, is to be used in the context of digital twins of robotic systems. So here you have a digital twin of your uh, real robot system where you employ your mathematical model of the robot to do, for instance, uh, visualization, safety monitoring, and predictive maintenance. And in the mathematical model, you use uh, the real-time data of the real robot uh, to do all these things. And uh, based on this, you can adjust uh, the planning of the robot. So for instance, if you experience uh, if you monitor the safety and uh, evaluate that uh, you hit a coworker, you could uh, stop the robotic uh, system from moving for instance <clears throat> so as an example uh, we used the universal robots manipulators uh, specifically the ur5e which is shown in this uh, figure and it's a robotic arm with uh, six joints and a rated payload of five kilograms. But in principle, it could be any uh, industrial robot from KUKA, FANUK, or yeah, whatever. So what we want to do is to calibrate the dynamic model of the robot. And this uh, dynamic model will predict the actuator current given the motion of the robot. So this amounts to estimating the dynamic coefficients for each link of the robot. And for each link, we have a uh, mass, we have the center of mass position and the inertia tensor. And what we assume uh, that we know is the angular positions of uh, all the joints and the geometric parameters of the robot. <coughs> So for the, with respect to the angular positions, we measure those directly on the robot using high resolution encoders. And for the geometric parameters, we basically have those from the, uh, from universal robots uh, from the company. <clears throat> so just to give a simple example uh, for the system, I made this, uh, one degree of freedom robotic system here, uh, which consists of an electric actuator uh, lifting a payload, uh, which is subject to gravity. And uh, such a simple system results in the dynamic model that you see here, if you can see my mouse. Uh, I hope you can. So this is basically the torque, which is a function of 
the mass moment of inertia of the system and the angular acceleration. And then we have some uh, gravity talk as well. So this is a rather simple example for this single degree of freedom system. <clears throat> but uh, when we uh, extend the equations to handle six degree of freedom systems, uh, such as the universal robots manipulators, we get some uh, rather long equations. Uh, so just to kind of sketch the complexity, uh, if you paste the equations into Office Word, you will get 1000 pages. Uh, so it's not something you want to derive by hand. Uh, you want to have some automatic uh, procedure to derive these equations and perform the calibration uh, of the parameters. So this is uh, what we developed. So I don't have time to go through the method in detail, so I'll just briefly outline the concept uh, of the methodology. So this uh, figure shows the parameter estimation and validation procedures. Uh, so here you have the estimation procedure and below you have the validation procedure. And the estimation procedure basically consists of commanding ro the robot to follow some specific motion. Uh, so this is the estimation trajectory. And then based on the measured data uh, from the robot, so this is the angular positions and the measured current, we are able to estimate the model parameters. Um, so this is what you see over here. So based on these model parameters, we generate a different trajectory. So this is the validation trajectory. And we evaluate whether uh, or how well um, our model with the calibrated parameters is able to predict the current uh, based on the measured angular positions. So this is what you see over here. So with respect to the model um, or the data collection stuff, we developed the UI interface software which is publicly available and you can install it using PIP. And uh, for the validation part, we developed the robot dynamics calibration software and this is not yet public, but uh, hopefully it will soon be. <clears throat> so just to give you an overview of the results, uh, Based on a single data set, we divide it into an estimation part and a validation part. This is uh, the separation of these data sets is what you see uh, with the red line here. And basically the top part uh, of the plot is the actual signals, uh, the measured ones and predicted ones. So the predicted ones are the black, thin lines and the measured ones are the colored lines uh, for each of the joints of the robot. And then below you have the error plot shown with the same scaling uh, as the top plot. Um, so yeah, this, uh, this basically shows that our model is generally, uh, the calibrated model is generally uh, able to accurately predict the actuator torques, but at this point, around 2 to 2.7 seconds, we have some uh, noise of the model, and we have uh, identified the issue to be with the friction model that we implemented, uh, which is rather naive, uh, so we need to uh, implement a different one. So, that was uh, about the results. So to wrap up uh, our future research, um, our calibration uh, method and results could be uh, useful. Uh, for instance, in the real time estimation of the payload or uh, uh, the friction uh, parameters, which is related to the wear. Uh, so this is relevant in the predictive maintenance uh, scenario. Then with respect to our calibration software, uh, we need to have the possibility 
for the software to automatically uh, generate an optimum trajectory for the system uh, rather than the user providing uh, that trajectory. So this one will enhance the uh, basically the calibration uh, performance. Then with respect to the interface software that I briefly uh, mentioned, we need to add some support for RapidMQ uh, to be able to visualize the robot in real time using the uh, Unity physics engine. So yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, thank you for listening. And thank you for your talk indeed. So uh, after email uh, in the plan should be Baidi. Is Baidi around? Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. Right. Uh, we, oh. I'm not sure if this is the first slide though. Yeah, indeed. So yeah. have a, okay. yeah, good luck. Uh, enjoy your talk. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. My name is Beidi Lei and I am a PhD student within the group. So I will be talking about um, a software system that I've been designing for my PhD that is called ASP for BEM, that, um, that is used for representing and reasoning about people in space. So a little bit of context. For every physical building, there's um, very often a digital model that corresponds to it. So in the physical building, there are components, um, distance between them, there are like colors of different components. And in the corresponding digital model, which is called the building information model, um, or um, BAME for short, there are, it's a formal specification of this physical building that contains objects, their relations, and the materials. But there is a significant gap between those two, which is um, that the physical building is a dynamic body, but a BIM is an inanimate structure for most of the times. And um, so in a dynamic body, the, the building interacts with its occupants, but in an inanimate structure, it does not understand concepts such as um, human or the perception or the behavior. And this is what my PhD is trying to do to to formalize and encode human experiences and behavior in the context of built environments. Um, and why is this important? If we look at state of our building regulations, there are tons of um, natural language codes that talk about human-centric design principles, such as in order for a visually impaired person to see states, you need to have high level of visual contrast. Or um, in order for a wheelchair user to access a building, we need to reserve enough space for this person to actually turn around outside a door, for example. And um, so, uh, sorry. So, and um, short of those design principles, we can easily find ourselves um, in enormous design flaws where a ramp might be too steep for a person to operate. Um, and, and other things where you open a door and you can easily fall off uh, from an edge. Um, and this is what ASB for BEM comes in. It's a dedicated spatial reasoning, um, which can be served um, as a melting pot for diverse human knowledge about codes, about regulations, about buildings, but also about common sense, um, what we know as um, what we have as background knowledge about space, about people, about objects, and how they operate, etc. Um, and but there are several challenges attached to each of those components. So first of all, if we look at regulations, um, this this code from Denmark that says essential information on wayfinding should be easy to see, easy to understand, and easy to follow. And then we see there are lots of ambiguous terms, and it were, in the worst scenario, we might even find redundant and conflicting information in codes. Um, and our approach for tackling those is by separating design goals from design solutions. So on one side, we're saying that um, RAMs should be usable by a person with limited mobility. So we have those high level um, design, design goals such as usability, accessibility, safety, et cetera. And we try to supplement this code with implied knowledge about who is gonna, um, who does this code apply to? So which, um, what, what kind of occupants? Are they on wheelchairs? Are they on crutches? 
and what kind of actions are they interested in performing? Are they trying to access the ramp? Are they trying to attain or approach the ramp? And under what circumstances is this code um, applicable? Um, so whether the, the user is currently in circulation or is trying to find its way around the building or even in, in an evacuation in an emergency scenario. And once we have all those user-centric parameterization, we can easily, we can uniformly and coherently translate qualitative descriptions into lower detail quantitative metrics that talks about the width or the slope of this ramp. And um, so this is what we call declarative problem solving, that we focus exclusively on what the problem um, should do in the end, what is the end goal of a problem, instead of, um, instead of defining different paths of achieving this goal. And um, for building models, so it's, it already contains a large amount of semantic and geometric information. So we already know that an object is a shower and the shower has contact with a wall and it's represented by some 3D geometry, for example. But because those information were assigned manually by a human, which means that they can be inaccurate, imprecise and uncertain. And our approach, um, our way of working around those problems is by trying to explicate best practices and expert assertions so that we, we are providing, we are enriching building models with um, those inferred properties in a very transparent and evidence-based way because that we know that this expert A says that the shower is accessible if it has enough space for a wheelchair user to turn around, for example. And um, in this way, so we can we can essentially augment the building with inferences, and every at each one of those inferences adheres to human common sense and expert knowledge. And finally, when we look at background knowledge, and then we can see um, so so because they are human knowledge, so they are implicit, incomplete, and failable by by nature. Um, and what we are trying to do essentially is by is by using what we call a uh, non-monotonic logic. So we are not assuming that we will just expand our knowledge by using detective rules, but instead we are trying to revise, we try to rectify and, and retract knowledge if new, in, if, if new information or observations come to light. And in this way, so we can document every little assumption and hypothesis that we make about um, code semantics or about buildings. So we, we can explain um, very clearly why we think a design is good or bad. And so this is ASP for BIM. It's a logic-based reasoning system for curing, analyzing, checking, and optimizing large-scale building models. And um, so how does this integrate into current code checking workflow? So on one side, you have some code requirements. For example, they're saying if a visibility polygon of a bathroom object and an access route overlap, then we know that this is going to be violation of the privacy. And, and on the other hand, we enrich um, a building model with those concepts, with visibility space and access rules. And AST for BAM will be able to execute this rule to assess this rule against this building and to produce a, a compliance result. So from an implementation perspective, we have a BIM, uh, we have a building model, and this model is passed into one side, a semantic knowledge base, and on the other side, a geometry database. And this process usually takes a couple of minutes, um, but you only have to do it once. And then ASP of BIM will be able to check to assess your formalized roles and constraints against all those knowledge base and produce a result in merely seconds. And so those results can refer to, for example, predictions of occupant experiences. It can be um, the compliance of a building model, and it can also be some opt optimal solutions where we know that something um, that something might not be completely correct, or there are some clear violations of the of some user-centric design concepts. And so ASP for BAME will be able to answer questions such as um, how is the science of visibility to a person, to a pedestrian? or what is the most energy efficient design? 
And um, so ASP for BAM, in this case, uh, it operates in a very reliable way because of its logic foundation. It is efficient because we've integrated a lot of special optimization techniques into directly into the software. And it's also configurable because we try to separate problem and um, Yes, so uh, from a future perspective, one of the main advantages of ASP for BIM is that it's a general spatial reasoner, which means that it can be tailored to different kinds of spatial temporal data, not only BIM, but also geographic information systems or point clouds or sensor data. And on the other hand, um, everyone, not, not only expert, everyone can express what they want to do with space, the curious they want to run with space in a very natural language, high level way. Um, so this can refer to, for example, design rationales, sustainability objectives, or even health guidelines, which are changing a lot because we're during COVID. Um, yeah, so that was some, a little overview of my PhD project. And so this was funded by the Danish um, Independent Research, Research Foundation, DFF. And I would like to thank my supervisors, um, Kurt Schultz and Peter Gom, and also my collaborators, so Ali and Johan, also from AU, John Fitzgerald from Newcastle, Johannes and Robert from the University of Auckland, uh, Jimmy and Andre Borman from TU Munich, and Elif from NTNU. So thank you very much. And if you're looking for like a prototype to play with, you can find it on GitHub. And if you had any other questions, you can send me an email. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your talk, Heidi. It was uh, uh, quite exciting to to see, to watch. Um, we are more or less back on track. So oh. if uh, Abdul is ready, uh, we could just uh, follow up uh, with uh, a presentation on the Varroa web application. Yes, awesome. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. We see your image as well. And, uh, and you see my image, right? You see everything? Yeah. And the slideshow is on, so good luck. Perfect. So, um, first of all, hi, I'm Abdul. Second of all, uh, this... Oh, wait, Abdul, sorry. Uh, it looks like an OVI. I'm in a little... There's a little square on top of your presentation with... Uh... There is a square on top of my presentation. Yeah, it was the team square. Yeah, now, now, now you're, you're done. Sorry. Okay, awesome. So... Um, Again, hi. I want to present my bachelor's project, which is very well web application. And if I want to describe that project with one simple sentence, it would be the one you can see on screen, how systematical logging can help save bees. So before I get into the whole nitty gritty, I want to talk a bit, just give a little introduction to the people that was a part of the project. So from the right to the left, you have my friend Mikkel, my friend Johannes and me. Uh, we finished this project in, uh, in late uh, January, where we also graduated as uh, awesome engineers. So, uh, yeah, but let's get into the project. So the big picture. What is it that makes this project awesome is it's actually very important. So um, it shouldn't be a surprise that bees nowadays, the bee population is declining. And it shouldn't also not be a surprise that bees are so important for our ecosystem because Bees, um, without their pollination of flowers, plow, flowers and crops doesn't bloom and kind of need that to survive. So the Danish Bee Association realized that one of the big reasons that the, the, the decline in uh, the bee population is due to mite infestations and specifically those varroa mites we're talking about, which is hence the name. Um, so. They, what they wanted to do was they wanted to make a project with Aarhus University um, with the department head being, or the head of the project being Kimbia. And the whole idea of this project was to enable uh, a beekeeper to predict when the most optimal time to treat a hive is. Because here's the thing, when you have to treat a hive for mites, first of all, you have to test the you have to test the hive to see the density um, of mites. Is it worth to make the treatment now? Because here's the thing, when you treat and when you test, you have to kill off some bees. 
and every time you make a test or a treatment, there is a chance that your hive aren't going to survive or isn't going to survive. So it's so crucial to actually make sure that you predict when the most optimal time is. And that is where me and my group come in. So this, we, we had some requirements. So what they wanted us to do was to take some of their legacy data or data for that matter and uh, make it possible to one, display the data for the whole predictability. And second of all, make it easier to actually um, log the data. So directly from the application, you can log the data instead of having to write it down in an Excel sheet and then upload it and import it. So with those requirements, we made um, a model of how we want our system to be, which you can see on the right. And it's very uh, basic. You have a beekeeper that interacts with his uh, hive. He can count, he can register a hive, and he can register some observations. Thereafter, the beekeeper can upload the registrations to the system and the cloud makes sure that everything is up to date. But with that said, we also have um, a role-based access system. And the reason we have that is because we want to make it possible for a researcher, for example, to go in and look at some of the data, um, for example, some regression data, and tweak the par parameters in case um, the current parameters aren't good enough or precise enough. So, um, so yeah, and if I haven't mentioned it, <laughs> the type of data we want to present is geographical data and regression data. One is to show, you know, the geographical part, um, which I can show in a bit. And the second one is to show, um, is to depict when the best time is. So one is for the place, one is for the time. I'll make it easier to understand in a second. So um, personally, in our group, we wanted to uh, challenge ourselves a bit. So what we wanted out from this project was, we wanted to develop a single page application and we wanted to do it without the use of any frameworks. So something like Angular and React and uh, Vue.js, that was out of the picture. We wanted to know which kind of things would give us trouble and um, how would we fix them and would we do it in the same way that they did. So that was um, something we wanted to try out. And in the end, we also wanted to make this a usable, um, a very intuitive and usable uh, application, which is why we tried to make it as uh, intuitive and not so colorful and all kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, let me just stop talking for a second and go over to the next slide so you can see the app. So I've taken some screen dumps. It's very, um, <laughs> Uh, there aren't so much colors and there aren't so many tabs or anything like that. It's very straightforward. You got a side menu and then you got uh, the big view. And that was the whole idea of it. Very intuitive. You don't have to have too much knowledge or any technological parts to be able to use this app. So, easy registration forms. What we did to actually try to make this a bit more intuitive was, for example, when you're registering your location for the app uh, or for your hive, what we did was we used some uh, auto completion features. So um, when you start typing an address, it will start suggesting <laughs> suggesting some um, addresses that matches the thing that you've written. On top of that, we wanted to uh, make it less error prone by using um, a map API. So we can use a map where you can just place a marker and the application will choose the closest uh, address to that marker. So by doing that, we would make it a bit more easy for, uh, for the person using it. But now comes the interesting part. So this is the heat map or density map um, that I was talking about. The whole idea with this is if you're, for example, in a green zone and you can see that there are um, red and yellow zones around you, you kind of have an idea that maybe it's time to think about testing your hive for mites. And uh, you can start making preparations that way. Um, so the whole idea was this was to give you a bit of a like idea of where you are, um, or where the density of mites are in um, in Denmark. Um, so that was like the geographical part. When you look at the time part, we used regression, a linear regression to make 
uh, this prediction. So um, what we have here is basically time on our first axis and then density of mites on our uh, second axis. And we have a damage threshold, which means that if you end up above that line, you can be kind of sure that your hive is not going to survive. Um, and with the yellow line, you know that you should probably treat the hive. And with the green prediction line, you can see that, OK, if my, um, if my observation is around a specific uh, week, that means that two weeks from now would be a proper time to actually uh, treat. So uh, this was our way to try to make it possible, uh, given the provide data, to uh, predict when and uh, when to actually treat. Um, to to make it more likely that your hive will survive. Um, with that said, there actually isn't very much to it. So if you want to conclude on something, well, did we achieve what you wanted to? Well, from the requirements perspective, we did. We made it possible to see, um, depending on the data we, we got, we could see the um, where in Denmark the density is highest, and we can also see, depending on the data we got, when the most optimal time is. We also made it uh, possible for uh, um, a stakeholder to actually tweak the parameters because until we actually get this in production, we don't really know if, uh, for example, a line of regression fit is the true fit, if it's the, the best ideal model um, for prediction. Um, so with that said, we just what we can say from all this is that data is important. Without this data, we couldn't, uh, we weren't able to actually predict something. We would uh, rely on probability and just guessing. So data is important to save the bees. <laughs> and uh, with that said, I didn't really go into the whole um, technical part of it, but uh, if you have any questions, feel free to um, catch me on anywhere you want. And uh, for a bit of further reading, Orbit Lab got, it, got uh, this project in its portfolio. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, inspiring talk uh, using linear regression uh, to save bees, uh, which is good. So we are ready for uh, our uh, last talk. Uh, last, but yeah, not the least, as usually said, uh, by Joan. Uh, are you around, Joan? I am around. Can you yeah, hear me? That's great. We hear you well. We see you well now. Yeah, I'll just share my screen then. Yeah, and we see your slides, so uh, have a good talk. Yeah, thanks. OK, uh, today I'll talk to you a bit about how we in Concipio work with the cyber physical systems for optimization of the biological industries. Um, my name is uh, Johan Eskor Thompson, and I'm a co founder and in charge of product development at Concibio. Um, and in the founding team of Concibio, we are all engineers from Aarhus University with the degree uh, within chemistry and biotechnology. So we're probably from another side of things than most of you are in this talk, at least. So you'll, you'll have to bear with me if I use the, the wrong terminology. But part of the way, uh, or the reason we're here today, is that um, Concibio is a, a spin out from Aarhus University, or at least we founded Concibio during our studies at Aarhus University, and we're part of the incubator space at Orbit Lab, who's also a part of this presentation. So uh, we were sitting with our startup company when we started studied from 2017 to last year, when we graduated and then all went full time in Concibio. So what does Concibio do? Well, we work within the biological industries. And what are biological industries? Well, that's all the industrial sectors that work with a living system. So something based on living organisms, living cells or complete animals as such. So that can be anything from the indoor farming to agriculture to aquaculture and insect production and wastewater and biogas to air quality. So it's a quite broad field, but all of these sectors work with living systems and that's something we know a lot about. And common to all these industries is that they are quite tightly linked to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
um, because they all represent some kind of green alternative or a more bio-based approach to producing the stuff we need and cleaning our water and such. And in Concibio, we are on a mission to enable the players in these fields with more data and with smarter data. The way we do that is with our platform, Monesco, which is an abbreviation for Monitor Estimate Control. In the core of Monesco, we have our IoT devices. These IoT devices either operate by cable or on battery devices and interact with sensors that are readily available on the market or actuators or complete SCADA systems, so complete control and monitoring systems that are already embedded in the conventional industries, uh, in the conventional bio industries. The data from these systems are then passed through our devices to our cloud, the Monesco cloud, which is also capable of ingesting data from the third party cloud systems. Here the data are locked over time and stuff like that. And then the users can interact with the data, visualize and do the, uh, the operations and, and actions they need to do. Both the operators working on site within these uh, industries, but also the managers who need a, a broad overview of how everything is performing. So within this space of IoT and cloud, there are a lot of competition. And we have a quite different background than the most players in this field, because we know something about the biological processes uh, and have learned a lot about how to build the platform enabling these processes. So what we focus a lot on is to develop what we call virtual sensors for these uh, the different biological processes. This could also be a, called a digital twin. It could be called a lot of different things as we've heard today. But a lot of our effort goes into taking the deep domain knowledge we have, combining that into mathematical models, into equations, and then embedding that as virtual sensors in our cloud, such that whenever sensor data arrives in the cloud, the model are solved in real time in parallel with the actual physical system, and thus provide much deeper insight to what is actually going on to the operators and also the managers of, of these uh, industries. So Monesco is this cyber-physical platform system that work in the interface between the biological process industries and then our end-to-end -end IoT and cloud uh, platform. And I just want to present one of the cases we have regarding insect production. So there are going to be more and more people in the world and we not need to, to feed them all and we need to do that in a more sustainable way. And one of the biggest issues with doing that is to provide enough protein, especially. That's pretty hard to do in an environmentally friendly way. And in that case, the production of insects in an industrial scale poses uh, very promising results because insects are much more uh, efficient at converting feedstock into new protein than bigger animals and when you compare it to imported soy and such. So there's a lot of efforts going on within this field. But as with many others, they need more data, they need more optimization to become, to become feasible. Well, one of the insects that holds the best promises is the black soldier fly, because the larvae of this fly are able to uh, convert very different kinds of feedstock, otherwise considered uh, wastes, into a lot of protein and do that very, very fast. Because in a matter of only a couple of weeks, they are able to almost double their weight 100, 100 times, uh, where the final larval stage contain up to 50% of protein. So if you compare that to a cow that would double its weight 100 times, that's uh, that's pretty impressive. So in the process of turning feed into new protein, what these insects do is that they ingest different kinds of feed, and then their biomass, so the mass of their bodies, increase, and their bodies contain a lot of protein, so that's the actual product. And in that process, they produce a lot of heat as a byproduct. 
So in order to optimize this industry as a whole, you need to understand how this basic conversion happens and what you can do to, to improve it. So what we're good at is to dive deep into the biological processes. And I won't go into much detail here, but the main idea is that carbohydrates, fats, and oil, and protein in the feed are in the larvae converted into their basic components and then used to create new energy, which in turn are used to build up new biomass to build more protein. And in this process, there are a lot of CO2 that are being produced along with ammonia and oxygen are being consumed. And this production and consumption will affect its surrounding environment. So that's something you can measure with the sensors. So if we are able to take these biological, biochemical processes and turn them into mathematical models, then we can relate these measurable parameters to very deep insights in what is actually happening within the core of this industry, within the biological process of this industry. So what we, uh, amongst other things, have been working on is a virtual insect sensor that is capable of, just by measuring these gases, provide insights on how well the larvae are growing and how well they are utilizing the feed. Just to show you some data, what you see here is from our platform a period of a week where very small larvae are given some amount of feed and then they are growing. And then from these measurements alone and our model-based approach, we have estimated the total amount of larval biomass, so the total amount of insects in the system when as they are growing over time. And what you see here in the last day is the manual measurement uh, uh, measuring how much biomass was actually created. And as you can see, there's a very high, um, a very nice fit between the estimations and, and the final data. And the reason partly why we want to do that is for a system like this, it's very, very difficult to get these insights as the process is progressing because insects are very small, so they live inside their feed so you can't just take them out and measure how big they are. And also, if when you do that, you have to do it a lot of times. So when you just can measure on uh, gas compounds and then estimate these parameters, that's very, very valuable. Because if anything happens, if a growth curve doesn't uh, follow the shape you expect it to, then you can detect anomalies right as they occur, not after a batch is done. And also you can detect whenever it's feasible to stop the batch, maybe before time, and thus increase turnover, and thus increase overall productivity. Just by using a model-based approach with an insect digital, digital twin or virtual sensor in a platform like this. Another treat of the insect is that they grow so fast that their bodies produce so much heat that they can actually inhibit their own growth processes. So it's quite important to know how much heat they produce because you want the system to be able to counteract. So we did the same thing with the same measurable parameters, linked that to the basic metabolism, and thus saw that what you see here is over the same period, the energy produced in the form of heat here measured indirectly, and on the red here measured from these measurements alone. And thus, when you have these measurements, you can make a system that can react to the changes as they occur, so you can cool down the process and thus save the productivity by having this uh, estimated signal sent down control signals can turn off a valve or something like that. And, and this project right here is a project we're running, uh, which is funded by the Danish Agricultural Agency under their GDP um, project. We are running that in collaboration with the Aarhus University Department of Animal Science, and then Enorm Biofactory, the, the, the biggest insect producer in Denmark. And the, yeah, the project is called FlyCloud. So that's just one example of how we work with this cyber-physical approach to optimizing biological industries. And we actually have similar projects running within biogas and wastewater, um, and also larger projects coming up. So we think there's still a lot to be done, but uh, yeah, it's a really interesting area and we at least want to do our contribution to it.
yeah, that's a continuous story and how we work with this stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. Um, uh, this is a good time for a wrapping up of this session. I'm not sure, probably just uh, do a last sharing. Uh, so if you see the slide in your screen, hopefully it uh, just shows that uh, there's a next event in terms of the live from behind walls. So next June uh, the 30th, just uh, uh, drop us a message or register if you want to um, uh, join and present. Uh, I think Lita posted in the chat how to do that as well. Uh, thank you all for, for coming and uh, we hope to see you soon in uh, our next editions. And um, yeah, uh, take care and uh, see you soon.